sharing with us this morning. All right, if you have your Bible, I hope you do, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 16 as we're continuing our study looking at the life of Abraham. And I want to start off this morning by asking you to think with me about the relationship between trusting in God and patience. Or to put it another way, is it possible to be full of faith and impatient at the same time? Now, I was thinking about this and I was thinking, well, okay, in one sense I think that's possible because I am, I have faith that Jesus is coming back and I'm impatient for that. But, but there's another sense in which if I am full of faith, then what I know is that Jesus is coming back in the right time, at the right time, at the time ordained by God, and though I am desiring for it to happen, I am patient because it will happen in God's perfect timing. I, I, I think there is a relationship between trusting God and being a patient person. I also want you to think, is there a relationship between trusting God and having hope? Or to put it another way, if you are a person who's trusting in God, is it possible that you could have lost hope? Think again about the promises that God has made that he's sending his son. In, in first Pete, no, it's Second Peter, where, where Peter is addressing people who have lost hope in the second coming. And they've said, you know, it, it's been years, and Jesus hasn't come back, and so they just don't believe it's going to happen. And Peter says he is not slow in keeping his promises, as some count slowness. He will return. He's patient and long-suffering. He will come in the perfect time. So Peter says, don't lose hope, because there is a connection between trusting God and having hope. That's why faith is defined in Hebrews 11 as the assurance of what? Things hoped for. And in Hebrews 6, the writer says, We desire that each one of you show the same earnestness to have full assurance of hope until the end, so that you won't be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hope and patience and faith are all kind of like this, right? And one last thought. Think about the relationship between trusting in God and taking matters into your own hands. Whenever I think about this, I think about uh, 1 Samuel 24. There's a story in 1 Samuel 24 where David, King David, not yet king, but he's been promised that he will be the king. God has said, I intend for you to be the king. He's being hunted by the current king, Saul, who wants to kill him, right? And he's been on the run for years, hunted by a man who wants to kill him. And David is hiding in a cave one day, and in comes Saul. And here's the moment where David can put an end to the whole deal and he can become the king God's promised him to be. All he has to do is kill Saul. And David backs off, cuts the corner off of his robe. You know the story. He says, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. I'm going to let the Lord take care of this. I'm not going to take matters into my own hands because I trust God to take care of something. And I'm not going to violate God's command not to murder just in order for me to be the king. So what I'm suggesting here is that faith and patience and hope and not taking matters into your own hands are all weaved together. And as we'll see in Genesis 16 this morning, uh, this is a part of the story for this. I'm suggesting that it is that if you are impatient, you can still demonstrate faith, but it's a flawed faith. It's It's a faith with holes in it. And I'm suggesting that if you are trusting in God, if you have faith in God, it means you continue to hope in His purposes and His plans, but that hope can sometimes be flawed hope too, right? I mean, this is the imperfect faith that every one of us possesses. Nobody in the room has got perfect faith. I'm also suggesting this morning that we tend to want to take matters into our own hands. We have this kind of ends justify the means thinking, this pragmatic idea, and it reveals a flawed faith as well. Here's the good news. You are right there with Abraham, the father of faith. 
We're studying the life of Abraham this summer. Mike Morledge last week took us through Genesis 15, and he pointed us to verse 6 where it says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Pivotal verse in the Old Testament, a verse that in the New Testament Paul points back to and says, this is where God and Abraham, uh, where their relationship was, was put right. This is where Abraham became a friend of God. How? Abraham became a friend of God not because uh, he, he brought good works to God and God said, I'm going to give that to you. He became a friend of God because he trusted God. He believed God. He believed that God would indeed bless all of the nations through him. That was the promise. Through his seed, God would bless all of the nations. Paul says, Abraham foresaw the day when Jesus would come. And he rejoiced, and Jesus said that. Abraham saw my day, he rejoiced in it. And God said, because you believe that I will fulfill my promises and I will bless the whole earth through you, we're now friends. We, we are reconciled. Now keep in mind, before that, a Abraham had, had just racked up a bunch of good works. I mean, he had... Uh, he had just rescued Lot from the, from the uh, oppressors, and he'd just paid a tenth of his money to Melchizedek. The, the, so, so he could come into God and say, I did this, I did this. God says, that's not what matters. What matters is that you believe the promises that I've made. And that's what Genesis 15 is all about. And right on the heels of that, right on the heels of this great declaration, Abraham believed God. We get to Genesis 16 where Abraham doesn't believe so much, where we see the holes in his faith, where we see that just like you and me, he is of little faith, just like Jesus said to the disciples, O ye of little faith. Not no faith, but holy faith. I don't mean holy as in holy, I mean with holes in it, faith with holes in it, flawed faith. One of the major lessons we ought to learn from the life of Abraham is that our right standing with God, our friendship with God, is not based on what we bring, just as it wasn't based on what Abraham brought. It's not having enough good at the end of your life to outweigh the bad. Your right standing with God, your friendship with God, just like Abraham's, is based on the fact that you believe him, you trust him, just like Abraham did, imperfectly, but it's there. We, we are declared righteous based on what God has done and the same criteria by which Abraham was declared righteous by God. And I should also say here, some of you may be wondering, what is the big deal about whether we're declared righteous by God or not? I mean, that's kind of religious sounding language. So God declares you righteous. What does that even mean? Why does that matter? And here's, here's the answer to that. In order to be a friend of God, you've got to be righteous. The unrighteous are the enemies of God, and God has promised that one day he'll bring judgment and pour out his wrath on them. The only ones who will be with him are those who are his friends. Well, how do you get to be a friend of God? Well, one way you can try to be a friend of God is by trying to keep the law perfectly. Okay? Now that that's over, right? Now that you know that ain't going to happen, that hasn't happened, I'm already in a world of hurt if that's the case then you need another solution. And the solution is one that God provides where he says, you can be my friend if you will trust in the work of Christ on your behalf. That's what Abraham was doing in a, in a pre-cross way. And uh, again, it was, it was imperfect faith. I think God wants us to see this morning that Abraham's faith has flaws and holes just like ours does. And yet that does not negate the covenant promises that God made to Abraham. Look, that's great news, isn't it? Amen. Is it not good news that when your faith is weak, God doesn't say, okay, enough of this. I'm done with you. It, it is good news that when you have a lapse like Abraham does, God doesn't go, that's it. I told you seven times and it's over. That was number seven. We're done. Even when we blow it, and we do, just as Abraham did, God is faithful to keep his promises as we confess, as we repent, and continue to trust in God. So with that as our introduction, we're going to look at Genesis 16 together. And what I'm going to do this morning is we're going to read through the chapter. Normally we read through it and then go back. This morning we're just going to read through it real slowly, and I'm going to stop and make editorial comments along the way. Okay? So we will we'll work our way through this chapter together, and uh, we'll start reading now. We'll be done about a half hour. Okay? So let me pray as we turn our attention to God's word, Genesis 16, verse 1. God, we ask that you would speak to us now, that you would open our eyes and ears, open our hearts, 
that we would hear and that we would learn and that we would obey your word. Lord, we are listening. We want to hear what your spirit would say to us. So speak to us, we pray, through your word, by your spirit. We pray in your name. Amen. Genesis 16, beginning at verse 1. Follow along with me. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Okay, we'll stop right there, all right? I mean, we're just going to go slow. We don't know how long it had been between Genesis 15 and Genesis 16, but in Genesis 15, God says to Abram out in the desert, look up at the sky, count the stars. Can you do that? Abram says, no, too many stars to count. He says, that's what your descendants are going to be like. You will have descendants as great as the stars in the sky. And Abram says, well, all I've got is Eliezer from Damascus. God said, I'm going to give you a son who will be the heir, and you're going to have a multitude, your offspring. This is going to come from your own body. And then he has this covenant ceremony that we saw last week where the animals are split in half. The presence of God goes between them to say, may it be done to me. May I be divided. May I be put to death if I don't keep my word. So that's where we are. And now you get to Genesis 16. Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. We have a dilemma. God's made a promise. The evidence is in, and they they contradict one another. What do you do when the promises of God and the circumstances of life don't seem to match up? Do you trust the circumstances of life, or do you trust the promises of God? That's the dilemma Abraham finds himself in. Now, there is both theological and there is emotional significance to the statement, Sarah has borne no children. The theological significance is how are the promises of God going to be kept? Where will the seed for the Messiah come from if Sarah has borne no children? But the emotional significance, here is Sarah beyond childbearing years, never having experienced pregnancy. She has suffered through the pain of infertility. Let me just say a word here about infertility. God is the one who opens and closes the womb. I don't understand why God would put the desire in the heart of a woman to want to be a mom and then close her womb. I don't, I don't get that. I can't explain that. There's nothing in Scripture that I can point to and say, here's why. It is hard and it's painful, and I weep for those who experience that pain. But I know God's good. This is one of those cases where the promises of God and the realities of life don't seem to match up. And you can either become bitter and blame God or say something's wrong, or you can say, I will trust in him. I will find my joy in him. I will cry out to him. I'm not saying you just stuff down your feelings. I'm saying you live out your feelings in front of him. You do what the Psalms do. You pour out your heart to God. You let him know of your longings and your desires. But you trust in his goodness, whatever happens. Reading a passage like this can be painful for women who have experienced or are experiencing infertility. And if that's the case for you this morning... I don't have platitudes to give you. I, don't, I, I wish I had the silver bullet that would cause you to go, oh, okay, that's, I get it now, thanks. It's not there. But I do know that you have to keep counseling your own soul with what's true. You have to know that God loves you. You have to know that God wants what's best for you, that he wants you to bring glory to him, that he's going to do what's for your good and for his glory, and you have to find your strength in that. In Sarah's day, to be a woman who had not conceived, who had never been pregnant, who had not brought forth a child, was to be a worthless woman. That's a harsh, hard statement, but that's how it was viewed in her day. What are women good for in Abraham's day? Please hear me say in Abraham's day. I'm not suggesting this for my, okay? In Abraham's day, what are women good for? To have kids, take care of the kids, to have a family. That's, that's what you get married. Be fruitful, multiply. So you do that, right? Sarah has been Abraham's wife for a while now. No kids. What's she good for? Answer in this culture, nothing. She has dealt with this personal reality of being good for nothing for decades. Not only that, she undoubtedly has a maternal instinct. So the longing to have a child, she wants to have a child. God is not 
opened her womb. The culture sees her as good for nothing, and she is heartbroken that she's never been able to have a child. Now Sarah, the Bible says, Abram's wife had borne him no children. Verse 1 continues, she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. This female Egyptian servant, likely one of the gifts that the Pharaoh had given to Abraham when the Pharaoh thought that Abraham or that Sarah was Abraham's sister. You remember that whole story in Genesis chapter 12? And so Hagar is one of the gifts that comes back to haunt the family in Genesis 16. Sarah Sarai says to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. Scandalous, right? Not in this culture. In this culture, this was perfectly acceptable. Abraham taking Hagar as a second wife was perfectly legal according to the marriage code of the day. Hagar was a servant. So if that's what you wanted your servant to do, that's what you do. And I, in fact, we should say that this represents a wrong view of humanity, but property, this woman, Hagar, was considered a property. If this is how you wanted to employ her, that was your prerogative. And Hagar, as a servant, could bear a child, and then if Sarah, her master, wanted the child to raise as her own, Sarah could say, I'll take that one as my child. She could have this forced adoption on Hagar, making Hagar just a surrogate for the family. So that's Sarah's proposal. I should point out here that while this was culturally acceptable in Abraham's day, this was not acceptable in the Lord's sight. God's design for marriage is made clear in Genesis chapter 2, where he says, For this cause a man leaves father and mother, cleaves to his wife, the two become one flesh. It is never God's design that a man leaves father and mother, cleaves to his wives, and the plurality become a number of one fleshes. That is not what the Bible teaches about marriage. The idea of polygamy, which was practiced in the Old Testament, was never God's design. People often wonder, well, why did God allow it? Why did God sometimes seem to bless polygamy? Well, you'd have to ask the same question about why does God sometimes bless you in the midst of your own iniquity? Amen. That doesn't necessarily mean that the iniquity is justified. And that's the case here. There is nothing in Scripture that says God's purpose, God's design is for polygamy. But here we have Abraham and Sarah being more influenced by the marriage customs of their culture than they are by God's design for marriage. And by the way, I think that applies to where we are today. I think we have Christians being more conformed to the cultural images of marriage than they are to the Word of God. Did you know that most people getting married today have lived together prior to marriage? Most people. That's the majority. The, the, the average path to the altar leads through an apartment. That's how most people do it. That's how lots of Christian people do it. You say, well, how can Christian people do it? Because they look around the culture and they say, well, maybe this is smart. Maybe we should have this trial marriage before we get to the altar. Because their hormones are raging and because the world is saying, let's do it, and they move in and have a practice marriage, a trial marriage before they get to the altar. In fact, most people today, Christians before marriage, are sexually active. They are more conformed to what the culture says is the norm than they are to what the Word of God says is the standard. Abraham and Sarah lived in a day just like that. We live in a day just like that. And we live in a day where the majority of people in our country believe that it's okay to redefine marriage to be something other than what God defined in Genesis chapter 2. And I think we can pretty much count on the fact that the redefinition of marriage has not seen its apex in our day. I think in my lifetime polygamy will be codified and legalized as an acceptable marriage alternative for those who want multiple partners. My point is this. 
Faith in God, trusting God, means that when you read his design for marriage, you say, that's what we'll do no matter what the culture says is acceptable. And to bend in the cultural winds is to say the culture knows better than God about what's right and what's wrong and what will promote human flourishing. Keep in mind, that's the reason God designed all of this in marriage in the first place. Not because he has some hard path. It's not an obstacle course for human behavior. It's all designed to promote human flourishing. You want to flourish? This is the way to get there. <clears throat> but here are Abraham and Sarah saying, you know, it's culturally okay. If you go in and you lay with Hagar, and if she produces a child, everybody knows that's okay in our culture today. And that's what Sarah suggests they do. And look at what it says at the end of verse 2. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. Now, whose voice should Abram have been listening to? The voice of God. This language here is intentionally used by Moses because there is a parallel between Genesis 16 and Genesis 3. What you see in Genesis 16 is an, an echo of Genesis 3. What happened in Genesis 3? Eve came to Adam and said, here, here the, the serpent, here, take, and, and, Ab, or, and, and Adam listened to the voice of his wife, and he ate. It's the same thing here, except there's no snake around. I mean, there is, but, you know, we don't see him, right? He's not slithering here. Abraham did not listen to the voice of God, nothing to indicate that he asked the Lord what to do. He listened to Sarah, his wife. Verse 3 says, Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan. Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abraham, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. Moses is making it really clear in what he writes here. Verse 1, he says, Sarah was Abram's wife. Verse 3, he says, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband. You see, we should know who these people are by now, right? It's not like, oh, I need to be reminded that Abram is Sarah's husband. No, you don't need to be reminded of that except that Abram is saying, you, or that, that Moses is saying, you see what's going on here? Sarah the wife gives the servant to the husband. The identification of wife and servant and husband is designed to say there's a problem. Let me pause here and make a couple of observations about the husband and wife relationship that we see here in these first few verses. Because there's some marriage stuff going on here that we ought to pay attention to. First, Sarah is guilty of offering bad and ungodly counsel to her husband. You might think, now wait, maybe Sarah was thinking to herself, Abraham, you, you told me that God is going to make us a great nation. I'm obviously barren. We've got to figure out how to, how to solve this problem for God. So maybe the Hagar solution is the right solution. I'm just trying to honor God in all of this. You might think maybe that's on Hagar's mind. No, it's obviously not, because if you look at verse 2, she says, Go into my servant that I may obtain children by her. Why is she proposing this? She wants kids. This is not I want to honor God. This is I want kids. She is so driven by her own emotion. This is what I want, and I'm so consumed with it that she's proposing ungodly counsel to her husband. Ladies, you ever been guilty of that? ever been so consumed by what you wanted that you cried and you pouted and you suggested to your husband that we should do this or we should do that and if he said I don't think so you froze him out you ever have done anything like that God gave wives to husbands because men need help Okay, Genesis 2. I'm not, I'm not just, this is just not, men need help. Adam's not good for him to be alone. I will make a helper for him. If the Garden of Eden had been male only, there would have been laundry all over the garden real quick, right? I mean, I'm not, I, that's, but you understand my point. Man alone, he needs help. 
So God says, I'm going to make a helper suitable, not just somebody who does the chores. I'm going to make somebody who balances him, somebody who, when he is weak, can offer godly counsel, somebody who can be a spiritual counsel to him, a spiritual support. Your husband, ladies, needs your input, your support, your thoughts, your suggestions, your ideas. He needs you to be an active participant in your marriage. But listen, he needs your counsel to be godly counsel. He does not need your counsel to be just selfishness being poured through your own poutiness. Okay? He needs you, before you offer counsel, to pray and study God's word and seek godly counsel yourself and answer the question, what would honor the Lord here, not what do I want? So when you go to offer counsel for your husband, you ought to stop and ask the question, is this what the Lord would have us do? Have I prayed about this? Is this something that, that God would want us to do? Not, or, or, or am I just proposing this because this is what I want? By the way, men, husbands, God has given your wife insight and perspective into matters that you don't have. You ought to desire her input. You ought to seek her input. You should listen carefully to her perspective because she will help you see things you cannot see because God's made her different than you. But guys, here is where Abram blew it. His wife came with ungodly counsel, and what should Abraham have done then? He should have said, honey, 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 no, 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 sweetheart. This is not what would honor the Lord. This isn't how God's going to keep his promise to us. We've got to trust him. I, I know you want kids. I ache for you as well. He should have empathized. He should have sympathized with her. He, he should have come alongside and wept with her. But then he said, sweetheart, we've just got to keep trusting the Lord. That's what he should have done. What he did was the same thing Adam did in the garden. Instead of leading and protecting, he just capitulated and went along. He may have thought to himself, I'll do this because I know I want my wife to be happy. She wants a child. My job's to make her happy. No, 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 no. No, your job is not to make your wife happy. Okay, some of the ladies are going, can we leave church now? I don't like what the pastor's saying, okay? (laughs) Husbands, your job, I, I like the way Russell Moore says it in the film series, The Art of Marriage, that we did. He said, you, in, in making decisions, in leading the home, a husband should make a decision that his wife or family may not be happy with immediately, but five years from now, they'll be happy that he made that decision. That's what a husband's got to do. What will honor the Lord and what's good for the long term of our family, not just what will buy me peace and what will get me more than a cold meal tonight. I had a friend who went to a men's conference a number of years ago. And he came back, it was a weekend long conference called The Role of the Man in the Family. And he came back, I said, how was the conference? He said, it was good. I said, what'd you learn? He said, here's what I learned. The guy said, if there are problems in the marriage, it's your fault. (laughs) I said, wow, that sounds harsh. He said, said, what he's saying is it's your responsibility as the man. If there are issues in your marriage and your family, you have the responsibility to lead, to solve, to get help, to fix it. That's not your wife's primary role. That's your role. I think he's right. Let me ask you a question. In the Garden of Eden, who ate the fruit first? Who? The woman, right? Okay. Gave it to her husband. Then God comes looking for him. Who does God come looking for? Adam. Adam, where are you? Adam, what happened here? Adam, explain this. Not that Eve's not culpable, but who's responsible? Adam. Who's responsible in Genesis 16 for what's going on here? Abraham. Guys, you get this? The weight of responsibility is on you. So you can't say, well, my wife just, she kept her right. No. Be a man. So men, you got to say, some men would say, you know what? My wife has a better sense of what would honor God than I do. I mean, my wife's the more spiritual one in our relationship. She knows the word better. She prays more than I do. She's more spiritual than I am. So I'm just going to let her make those spiritual decisions. No, that's not the solution to that. Here's the solution to that. You need to study and pray and and learn and grow. You got some work to do. Okay, we got a lot of ground to cover, and I'm. Let's get back to this. Verse four. 
Some of you are going, you said a half hour and we're almost there. Verse 4, when she, Hagar, saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Now just imagine being Hagar for a minute. You're one of the slave girls. You're, just, you're picked out of the crowd. Sarah comes to you and says, I got a job for you to do. What's the job? We're trying to have kids. I can't have kids. I want you to lay with Abraham and I want you to become pregnant and I want you to, to bear us a child. And first of all, you got picked out of the crowd. So it's like, look at me, you know, I'm the one out of all the slave girls, I'm the one who gets picked. So there's a little bit of pride working in her already, right? And then she is with Abraham and she conceives quickly. And it's like, I can do what Sarah couldn't do, right? So a little pride going in there. And now she's with the child and she's about to have this baby and she's, and, and she's, she sees Abraham from time to time. He smiles at her because he's happy that she's pregnant. She thinks, I think he kind of likes me. She starts to imagine to herself, there, I can see a day when the baby and I move into Abraham's tent and it's Abraham and me and the baby makes three and Sarah's living out in the guest house somewhere, you know? I mean, this is kind of what's going on in her heart. Now, she, she was not drawn into this thing by her own doing. She was a servant. In this culture, she was doing what he was told to do. But this getting puffed up with pride thing, she's got to own that. Okay? Nobody in the culture told her, you should be proud. Nobody in the culture told her she should start to get swelled up with this stuff. So she's got her own issues. Meanwhile, here's Sarah, who didn't anticipate all of the ramifications of Hagar becoming pregnant. She didn't stop to think of what this would do to the family dynamic. All she said was, I want kids. And now here's the reality of this situation, this young, glowing mother-to-be, who Abraham smiles at every time he sees her, who maybe about to give her a child, but she's just growing in her hatred and her bitterness for this young woman because it's just exposing she could do what you couldn't. This would have been, by the way, the perfect time for Sarah to go to Abraham and say, I blew it, honey. I never should have suggested this deal. I, I, I've made a mess of things. Um, I, I just want to I, I ask for your forgiveness. I should have been patient. I shouldn't have given up hope. I, I should have trusted God. I've asked the Lord to forgive me. I want to ask you to forgive me too. That would, if we had that in here, if that was the next few verses, we would have a lovely story of redemption and God's blessing. But that's not what she does. Look at verse 5. Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. What? This is Sarah doing the same thing that Adam did in Genesis 3. Genesis 3, God comes to Adam and says, Adam, where are you? What happened here? The woman you gave me she blew the whole deal. Here's Sarah going to Abraham and saying, this is all your fault. A.W. Pink says about this verse, how true to human nature, that is fallen human nature, to throw the blame of wrongdoing upon another. Ooh, right? Man ever seeks to shelve his responsibility and charge either God or Satan or others with what he terms his misfortune. We all think that the problems in our life are because somebody else foisted them on us. Once again, here's a perfect opportunity for Abraham to say, sweetheart, we both messed up here, okay? Wasn't, it, was, it was you and me both. I should have never done what I did. Please forgive me. Let's go to the Lord. Let's ask him to forgive us both and, and ask him to make this right. Could have done that. But what does Abraham do? Verse 6, behold your servants in your power. Do with you as you please passivity from Abraham. Classic male passivity. Don't bother me. I'm watching the game. You got a problem with the servant. Go take care of it. I want to deal with this. And Sarah dealt harshly with her and she fled from her. That is, Hagar fled from Sarah. The word dealt harshly here, same word Moses will use in Exodus to talk about how the Egyptian slave masters treated the Hebrews, when there was more bricks, less straw, she beats her. That's what she does. She beats the pregnant woman. And Hagar says to herself, I'm not saying around to get beaten. They thought, 
forget this, I, my baby and I are going to Egypt. And that's where she's heading, back home to Egypt. It's been nice staying here. Everything was cool until this happened, but I'm out of here now. And so that's where Hagar heads, out to Egypt on her own. She has this encounter with the angel of the Lord. Look at verse 7. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, a spring on the way to Shur. Now, we don't know who this angel, this messenger of the Lord is, but most Bible scholars believe that this is not simply an angel, angel like Gabriel. Most Bible scholars believe that the angel of the Lord is a theophany, a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus in human form as the messenger who comes, that this is Jesus coming here. And I'll explain to you why we think that here in just a minute. The angel asked Hagar two questions in verse 8. He said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, by the way, he points out, he reminds her of who she is. Because what's she been thinking? She's been thinking, I'm the wife of the, or I'm the mother of the baby, right? No, servant of Sarai. Two questions. Where have you come from? And where are you going? The angel is not asking that question because he does not know the answer. Why is the angel asking that question? Because he wants her to think about, where did you just come from and where are you headed? Let's see, where did you come from? The tents of Abraham. Oh, you mean the place where God is at work on the earth today? You mean the place where the blessing of God is being poured out through this chosen one of God and through where all the earth, nations of the earth are ultimately going to be blessed? Where God is present? That's where you came from. Where are you going? Egypt. What did we say about Egypt a couple of weeks ago? Egypt is always a picture in the Bible of the place of human achievement, the place apart from God. Where have you been? I've been in the presence of God. Where are you going? Away from God. That's the question that's being asked and answered here. She's running away because she's been beaten. And you can't blame her too much, I mean, right? But look at verse 8. She says, I'm fleeing from my mistress Sarah. In other words, I'm getting out of this punishment. Verse 9, the angel of the Lord says to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. Wow. Really? Go, go back to where I was getting beaten? Well, let's keep in mind that part of the reason for the beaten going on is because of the swelled up pride in Hagar. You go back as the servant of Sarah, you go back with humility as the handmaiden of the Lord in this situation, you go back and say, I'm, I'm here to do what you want me to do. It, I don't think it's God saying, go back into, a, into domestic violence. Okay? I don't think this is God saying, look, ladies, you know, your husband beats you and you need to go back into that situation and just keep getting beat. I don't think that's what God's saying at all. I think God's saying, go back, return, repent, be humble, be a servant, I'll protect you. And by the way, those questions that the angel asked the Lord are good questions for us when we find ourselves in a mess. When, when life is a mess for you, two good questions to ask is, where have you come from and where are you going? How did you get in this mess? Are you coming from the presence of the Lord? And going away from it? If so, get back. Get back. I'm not going to go there. Yeah, I know. Mike was expecting a little Beatles to break out there, but get back to where you once belong. You could look at Hagar and say, look, she's an innocent. This is not her fault, right? And it's not completely her fault, but the angel of the Lord says, return and submit. He's saying, it's better for you to be back in this situation, even if there is even if you have to suffer at some level, to suffer righteously for righteousness in the center of where God is, than it is to be running away from Him. There's a whole sermon there now, but we don't have the time. Okay, verse 10. Here's, what I think the, here's why I think the angel of the Lord is Jesus. Look what he says. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. Angels don't say that. Angels don't have the power to say that. If it's an angel, he's going to say, God will surely multiply your offspring. This guy says, I will do it. Who's the one who's going to do it? It's God. It's Jesus. And the angel goes on to say, he describes the son who's going to be born. The angel of the Lord said to her, verse 11, behold, you're pregnant. You shall bear a son. This is the, the first sonogram in the Bible. Okay. 
It's the first, we find out what the sex of the baby is before the baby's born. You shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. The name means God hears because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hands against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. Now, I just have to pause here parenthetically for a moment and say, Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. He's the father of Islam. In the Islamic tradition, Ishmael is considered the rightful descendant of Abraham. See, the, the, the Islamic faith believes that Abraham is the father. They just believe that it's through Ishmael that the blessing comes. Right? And so they, here's what they all, in their writings, they believe that God eventually led Hagar and Ishmael to Mecca and that Abraham came over and visited them in Mecca and that he built the first Kaaba, which is the, the sacred temple in, in Islam. He built it there in Mecca and he came back and visited them. This is, at, this is in the center of the mosque in Saudi Arabia. So this is their, their belief about what God is doing here. And this week, about 300 people have died in this part of the world because of what was prophesied in Genesis 16, right here, where it says, He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. Can I just say here, you have no idea how the sinful choices you make today, what the consequences of those might be for generations to come. Your choices do not just affect you. In some way, God uses our choices to set the trajectory for future generations. We've got to be careful. And let me just say, by the way, we've got to be really careful here. If you're sitting here thinking, descendants of Ishmael, bad. Descendants of Isaac, good. No. The problem's on both sides of the line, right? It's not, there are wild donkeys on both sides. Peace in the world will not come through Israel. Peace in the world will not come through Islam or the Arab nations. Peace in the world comes through the Messiah, who is the Prince of Peace, who transforms hearts of Jews and Arabs and Gentiles and makes them into new creatures. Our, we, we often look at this and, and we can have sympathies with, with the Palestinians, we can have sympathies with the Israelis. Our sympathies should be with the children of God on either side of the line. The, the, the followers, the, the spiritual descendants of Abraham, not the physical descendants of Abraham, either through Isaac or Ishmael. That's another whole sermon, we'll leave that. Chapter ends with Hagar acknowledging that this angel of the Lord is indeed the God Most High. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. She recognizes this angel is God. You are a God of seeing, for she said, truly, here I have uh, seen him who looks after me. She recognizes in this moment that this is her provision. By the way, can we just say, I believe here, Hagar is a faithful servant of God Most High, the, the, the mother of Ishmael, right? She's converted. She's trusting God. Therefore, the well there was called Bir Lahai'ah Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son. Abram called the name of his son, uh, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. So we've got to figure that if he calls the kid Ishmael, it's either because Hagar comes back and she says, I met God in the desert, here's what he told me, and all of this. He says, okay, we'll do that. We'll call him Ishmael. Or God comes to him and says, call him Ishmael. We don't know which it is, but somehow God makes sure that that happens. And then Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. A lot in this chapter, isn't there? And a lot about the difference between solid faith and flawed faith. There's a lot about being patient with the, with the promises of God, a lot about not losing hope, not taking things into your own hands, a lot about men leading spiritually, a lot about women being a helper, not nudging in the wrong direction, a lot about not getting puffed up with pride in what's going on. I, I like how Tim Keller sums up this chapter. He says, this text proves to you that the Bible is not a book of virtues. It's a book of gospel. 
It's not a series of stories of moral exemplars. It's a record of God's intervening grace in the lives of people who don't deserve it, who don't seek it, who continually resist it, and don't even appreciate it once they've been saved by it. Look, Keller says, who is the, uh, what, what is this teaching us? It's teaching us that the very best human beings in the history of the world are moral and spiritual failures. They can't escape the self-centeredness of their own hearts. God continues to come to them. He continues not to give up on them. He continues to patiently speak to them and to help them and to aid them and to save them and to rescue them again and again and again. That's what this chapter is all about. Who's the hero in the chapter? Abraham? No. Sarah? No. Hagar? No. The angel of the Lord? Yes. And I think there's an overarching point to be made in this chapter. I don't want to read more into the text than here, but I think the account of the birth of Ishmael God is giving us a living picture. We, we talked about types a couple of weeks ago. This is a type of salvation because God has promised Abraham, blessing will come to the entire world through your seed. Abraham says, let me help with that. And you get a mess. You get disaster. God says, let me do it supernaturally. Then you get blessing and a Messiah. You see, when Abraham looked at the dilemma, he said to God, I'll help out with this. I'll, I'll take care of it, God. You don't need to worry about it. It's the wrong approach. He looks at Sarah and he says, there's no way this can happen. There's nothing we can do. It would take a miracle from God for this to happen. And what happens? A miracle from God. See, Hagar and Sarah both are symbols, according to the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4, they're symbols of salvation by works and salvation by grace. In fact, I want you to turn there, and we'll look at this as we wrap up. Galatians 4, look at verse 22. So if you're in Genesis, you need to flip all the way over. No, you just need to go up and scroll down and pick, yeah, however you're doing it on your device there. Galatians chapter 4, verse 22. Paul says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. You can stop right there. Covenant of works, covenant of grace. That's what's pictured here. Paul goes on to explain that Hagar represents salvation by human effort or achievement, and, and uh, Sarah represents God blessing through his own miraculous uh, care. That's the choice in front of us when it comes to being a friend of God. Are you going to try and fix it yourself? Or are you going to, does it require a miracle of God for that to happen? Do you look at the question of how can we be reconciled to God and say, I got a plan that'll work? Or do you say, I am helpless. I got nothing. The gospel is good news. Your plans won't work. So cease striving. Be still. God's plan works. God's plan is pictured for us in this table that's behind me. God's plan, by the way, up here we got bread and we got wine that represents the death and the resurrection of Christ, his broken body, his shed blood. What do we have on this table that represents what you bring? Nothing. Because all you do is come and receive. That's the gospel. This table represents what Jesus has done. He says, come and receive. And that's what we want to do this morning. That's what we do each week to remind ourselves of the goodness of the gospel, to remind ourselves that God is a God of grace, not a God who expects us to work our way to salvation. God is a God who is faithful even in the midst of our flawed faith. That's what Genesis 16 teaches us. If you're a visitor with us here this morning, we practice open communion, which means everybody who loves Jesus is welcome here at the table to receive the bread and the cup. This is for people who are in the family, people who say, I know I'm a friend of God, not because I've done anything to deserve it, but because God has poured out His grace and mercy, and I've committed my life to Him. You're welcome at this table. If you're here this morning, you're a visitor, and you don't know Christ, I would encourage you, rather than coming, God wants you to meditate on all we've talked about here this morning and ask the question, do I want to be a friend of God? Do I want to be right with God? 
Do I want to be in the place of blessing? Where have I come from? Where am I going? That's the question God would have you meditate on here this morning. So let me pray for us, and then we'll prepare the elements, and you can come and receive uh, the elements this morning. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that what Abraham believed, what he saw in his day was you. We see it more clearly than he did because we look back and he was looking forward because we had your revelation. Lord, we confess that we are people of flawed faith, but we come this morning to, to confess again that we love you, that we want to honor you, and that we want you to change us and transform us and make us more into the image of your Son. Thank you for the gospel and all it represents. We pray in your name. Amen.
reading this morning, I hadn't realized this, you know, today's the 45th anniversary of the moon landing. Do you know that? Do you remember where you were 45 years ago tonight? Some of you going, I wasn't here. I, yeah, I got it. <laughs> but those of us who were alive remember it. What I didn't know is that uh, one of the astronauts wanted his first act on the moon to be to take communion. Oh. Was, that was done. It was not telecast because at the time there was already legal proceedings going on because they had read Genesis 1 from the rocket ship and the atheists didn't like that so they filed lawsuits against it so they said we can't do this thing but one of the astronauts took bread and wine and, and he reflected on the fact that God, God, God uses these elements to say that his presence is with us in the everyday things of life that he is present wherever we are whether it's moon dust or whether it's bread and wine God is there and that's what he wanted to celebrate as he stepped on the moon. Um, I'll put a link to that in my uh, newsletter this week, so if you, you can read the story of the uh, communion on the moon, okay? But on the night before Jesus was crucified, he took the bread after, at the meal, and after having pronounced a blessing, he broke it. He said, this bread is my body, broken for you, as often as you receive this, remember me. So we come this morning, Lord, to remember what you've done for us, to remember that it's not by works of righteousness that we are saved, it's according to your mercy, and that your body was broken as a substitute for ours. And we receive this bread with grateful hearts. Amen. In the same way, after the meal was over, Jesus took the cup, and after he pronounced a blessing, he passed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the remission of sins. And as often as you receive this, remember me. And so once again this morning, Lord, we remember that your blood was shed, that our sins could be forgiven. And we thank you that you have placed them as far as the east is from the west, that we will no longer experience any penalty for sin because you've experienced the penalty for us and that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We receive this with grateful hearts. Amen. If you'd stand, we'll sing that chorus. We cry holy, and I'll dismiss us with a benediction. We cry holy, holy, holy. We cry Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.